Hello friends and thank you for the great privilege that you've afforded me to share the Word of God with you today. It's a different medium and I'm a little bit uh, uncertain as to preaching to a, a lens rather than some smiling faces looking back. But I trust that we'll be blessed today as I share the Word. It's a great privilege for me to share a message with you which I hope will bring, encourage you and strengthen you in these days as well as giving an understanding, perhaps uh, a clearer understanding of how I see these days in which we live. So as we begin the word today, let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we share even through this medium of video and the internet, that you would be gracious to touch our lives by your Holy Spirit to quicken your word to us. That as we meditate upon these things and share, though we're apart, we are one in the Spirit. We pray that you'll bless your people, bless your word, and cause there to be a revelation of the greatness of our God in these days. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin, well first, first of all I want to say my message is an Easter message and it is entitled, if you want a title, it is called The Gospel of the Resurrection. And I want to begin uh, by reading Paul's letter or part of it to his son in the faith, Timothy. Now this is 2 Timothy. It is considered to be or understood to be the last uh, epistle that Paul wrote. In this epistle he is fully expecting his life to finish very soon and so he is giving pastoral counsel and he's giving advice to his son Timothy and so they're very serious words but they're very important words and I think we need to take heed. So in chapter 2 verse 1 and through to verse uh, 10 we read these words. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse 7, consider what I say, consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Verse 8, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Easter has always been for me the most wonderful season of the year. For the church and for every Christian, it's a time of reset. A time when we go back to basics, we remind ourselves of just how simple yet how absolutely profound the foundation of our faith is. This year it seems that it's not only the church that is facing this reset, but our whole world has been thrown a great challenge. And I believe it's a time for resetting our priorities, our families, and for the church especially, our mission in the world. I cannot recall a time in my life where the church was hindered from gathering on Easter Sunday morning or any other time for that matter. I'm sure that we are doing this for a good cause, but maybe this is a taste of what it would be like if genuine persecution was levered against Christians, as it is now in places like China and North Korea 
And I wonder when all this is over whether we will be awakened again as to how special and how precious it is for the saints to gather, to worship, to be in prayer, and the huge privilege of sitting under the preaching of the Word of God. I think the temptation to neglect the gathering of ourselves together that even in the New Testament times was apparent and rebuked by the writer of Hebrews it may be a thing of the past. I certainly hope so. I'm hoping, expecting we will see a great rise in appreciation and what it means to be the church gathered. In the meantime, like Paul, we can say prisons and closed doors may limit me from being with you. But he said the word of God is not bound. My message is in two parts today. First, I'd like to address this whole issue of isolation. And secondly, I'd like to come back to what Paul is saying, reminding Timothy in that verse where he says, remember that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Paul's gospel centered around the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Without the resurrection, we wouldn't be thinking or remembering the cross. Without the resurrection, there would be no church. Without the resurrection, we would have no salvation. My gospel, Paul said, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for this cause, I am in bonds. So let's talk about being cut off. Let's talk about being bound. Let's talk about being behind closed doors for this time of isolation. Is it a deprivation? Or is it a time when we can see some wonderful deep work of the Holy Spirit occur in our lives as Christians? A little historical perspective. We live in probably the third great technological revolution. We're in very, very important days. And in each of these previous two great uh, revolutions, great awakenings took place. The first began in 1440 with the invention by Gutenberg of the printing press. An invention but an invention that enabled the most remarkable change in society and move of God. Within 80 years, the Reformation took place because the Word of God was not bound. The second industrial revolution, travel exploded, transport, steam engine. The 18th and 19th century saw huge revivals and awakenings across the old and the new worlds. And now we find ourselves locked away, but the word of God is not bound. We would love to be together, but though, uh, but through what Boris Johnson called the wizardry of the internet, we can preach, we can teach, we can share our fellowship the world has become a very small place and the word of God is not bound. Let me tell you a couple of stories, historic situations of when isolation released tremendous blessing in the world. Now, as I said, we have never experienced in, in my lifetime any hindrance in New Zealand to not gather and to worship. And so we come to take it a little bit for granted. We go ho-hum, it's Sunday morning again. Or maybe we go, wow, it's Sunday morning again. I just cannot wait to get to church. But nothing has hindered us. Nothing has ever stopped us until now. But this wasn't always what it was like in history. Let me, let me talk about something that came in the first revolution and the printing press that achieved incredible results in the world. Now Martin Luther, the great reformer, was nailed his 95 thesis to the door in, in Wittenberg in uh, the beginning of the Reformation, 1517. And it's because he printed tracts, it's because he wrote a lot, that it soon 
this message of justification by faith alone through God's grace spread like wildfire. And so it was only four years later in 1521 he was tried for heresy. And the result of that trial was his excommunication from the church. His writings were banned and an edict, quote, we want him to be apprehended and punished as a notorious heretic was sent out right through Germany. And it also made it a crime for anyone in Germany to give Luther food or shelter. Talk about being cut off. And also it permitted anyone to kill Luther without any legal consequence. It's a fabulous story. But his sponsor and his great supporter, Frederick III, who was the elector of Saxony, had him intercepted on his way home in the forest near Wittenberg by masked horsemen impersonating as highway robbers, and they escorted Luther to the security of the Wattberg Castle at Eichnach. And it was this isolation during that time that he was there that he later referred to as my Patmos. Luther translated the Bible from Greek and Hebrew, starting with the New Testament, into the common language of German, and he also poured out doctrinal and polemic writings. In other words, he wrote a lot of tracts. Would he have done that? Had he not been locked away? Maybe. But he made good use of his time. And I trust that we will see this time in isolation as a time of blessing, of restoration, of revival, of restoring relationships, of appreciating family, and maybe writing a book, certainly doing some Bible study. The second story, which I think is fantastic, was concerns John Bunyan, who in, he was born in 1628 and converted after his marriage in 1649. And he became a preacher with a nonconformist group, a congregational uh, group who shared the local Anglican church where he lived in Bedford in England. And this was during the time of the Commonwealth and the rise of Puritanism. There was liberty, there was religious tolerance, especially for the Puritans. But that tolerance finished with the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. Those members of the Bedford meeting who were meeting with the Anglican congregation were banned because no preaching was to be allowed outside of an Anglican church and certainly not by anybody who wasn't a part of the state church. So in November that year, Bunyan and his group went to a farm near the village of Harlington, about 13 miles from Bedford. And while he was preaching, he was arrested for preaching and brought before the local magistrate. Now, there was an act of uniformity which didn't pass for a couple of years after that, but he was tried on an earlier uh, law, which uh, I've got the notes here. He was tried on an earlier law which had been passed in 1593, listen, which made it an offence to attend a religious gathering other than the parish church with no more than five people outside your family. So if you gathered with your family, it was okay, but if you added any more than five, it was against the law. So what was Bunyan to do? He believed he was called of God to preach. So the punishment there was uh, three months imprisonment for preaching and, and, and then followed by banishment or even execution if the person failed to promise not to reoffend. I think that the law was enacted probably because they were more concerned that these independent groups were plotting against the king, which of course was not the case in Bunyan's meeting. 
But he said, no, nah, I'm not going to stop preaching. And he ended up in prison for 12 years. But during that time, he wrote his testimony, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, and he wrote Pilgrim's Progress, which became the most published book of all of time apart from the Bible. And then lastly, let us go back to the Apostle Paul. He said, I am in bonds because of the gospel. What was so offensive about the gospel? What was it Paul was preaching that got people upset? Indeed, what was it that Bunyan was preaching that offended? And what was it that Martin Luther was preaching that got him imprisoned? Let me repeat the scripture. I suffer trouble, Paul says, as an evildoer, and I'm in bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Remember, Timothy, Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead, according to my gospel. If you read in Acts chapter 26, you see Paul's defense before King Agrippa. He says, I'm judged for the hope of the promise made of God. Unto our fathers, Acts 26, verse 7, unto which promise our 12 tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I'm accused of the Jews. Let's pause and think about that. Great hope the Jewish people had. And Paul was essentially saying, your hope has come. For this hope of Israel, I'm accused of the Jews for preaching this hope. Now, King Agrippa, verse 8, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? So in verse 22, he goes on in the same chapter and preaches the gospel. He said, having obtained help from God, I continue unto this day witnessing both to great and small, uh, small, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. That Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead. And should show light unto the people and unto the Gentiles. And so Paul was put in chains for this hope, for this preaching of the resurrection of Christ. There were many preachers in those days, some who taught great moral truths and many teachers of the law of Moses. Who attained great acclamation. But you see, Paul wasn't put in prison. For teaching the law. Paul wasn't put in prison for teaching any kind of religion. He was put in prison for declaring that the hope of Israel was fulfilled in Jesus Christ and that fulfillment was that he rose from the dead. What a powerful message. And so we know that he was taken to prison and taken to Rome. And ultimately ended up there. And in Acts 28, we pick it up again. When he came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. This is verse 16. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself. It's a bit like me. I've just got me and Lynn and the cat. We have been compelled to dwell by ourselves. With a soldier that kept him. And it came to pass after three days... Paul called the chief of the Jews together, and when they come together, he said to them, Men and brethren, though I've committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. The Jews spoke against it. I was constrained to appeal to Caesar, not that I had aught to accuse my nation of, 
For this cause, therefore, I have called for you to see you and to speak with you. Because for the hope of Israel, I am with this chain. So that was Paul's gospel. They got him imprisoned. And being imprisoned, to him, was a joyous thing. Not because he necessarily liked being locked up, but it was there that the prison epistles were written. Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, the letters to Timothy. And we have some of the richest understanding in the New Testament that came from his imprisonment. So what is this gospel? It's Easter. Let's remind ourselves of the glorious gospel of the resurrection. And I'd like to read part of the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and make a few comments as we define Paul's gospel. So let's read it together. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declared unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you also received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and after that he was seen above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained unto this present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as one who was born out of due time. I'm the least of the apostles. Not, I'm not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. By the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I laboured more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. Therefore, whether it be I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. So let's go over this and just point out a few things here. So this gospel, number one. It is a gospel that was received. Verse three. Paul says, I delivered unto you first that which I also received. Paul received the gospel from the Lord. It was received by the apostles from the very mouth and the presence of Jesus. Number two, he said, it's the gospel that I delivered to you. Not enough to receive the gospel, but it's imperative upon those who have received the gospel to deliver it, to pass it on. It was faithfully delivered to us. It was faithfully delivered to the Corinthians. It's been faithfully delivered to us. Now, what are you going to do with it? What am I going to do with it? We cannot hold on to the gospel. Number three, moreover, brethren, verse one, I declare unto you the gospel. It's a gospel that is declared. It's not a private philosophy. It is a gospel that must be declared and must be preached. For a gospel is not a gospel unless it is declared. And as I said before now, he says it again, that which I declare unto you, which you also have received. It's a gospel to be received. The good news is not, is not good news unless you receive it. So many today obsessed with bad news. Let me talk about this for a moment or two. There are purveyors of bad news aplenty if you want to listen. In this time of global trial and testing, you'll not find a shortage of pundits of doom. There are many who, in spite of decades and centuries of failed predictions of the end of the world and the great tribulation, still persist in claiming the latest threat to be this time, the wrap-up of history. I've heard so much prediction, so much philosophy. Every time there's a scourge or a dictator or something, somebody's going to say the Antichrist is rising. We came through a century, last century, with two world wars. 
a pandemic in 1918 that far exceeds what we're going through now. And yet we've got a people today. This is it. Antichrist is coming. It's the end of the world. I want to suggest to you we are in the third technological rev revolution in which God is about out of that to do great things. For the history of the world does not end in a whimper. It ends with the earth being filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And in fact, as Paul said to the Ephesians, it's a world without end. But chapter 4 of Ephesians is very important at this time because it says that men and women and others will be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and the slight and cunning craftiness of men whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And he said that he's given to the church teachers, apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers, so that the church, the saints, may be built up for the work of the ministry, which is what? It's to share the gospel. So that you're not tossed to and fro. So that your foundation is sure on the word of God. That you know the truth. And the truth will make you free. There's no need to be tossed to and fro. So it's a gospel to be received. But here's something wonderful. It is a gospel in which we stand. Knowing the gospel will enable us to stand. And it's on this gospel and in this gospel we stand. In chapter 16 of Corinthians, he said, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit, you like men, be strong. And he said, not only do we stand, but it's the gospel by which we are saved. But notice there's a condition. Only if you keep in memory that which was preached unto you. So Paul's reminding the church at Corinth what he preached to them. He's reminding them. And he's declared the gospel very, very simply here. It's this receiving of this gospel. The gospel that Jesus has been raised from the dead that we are saved by. We're saved eternally, but I believe we're saved in our minds, in our hearts, at times of trial and test as well. In 2 Corinthians, he said, we are helpers of your joy with this gospel. For by faith, ye stand. Stand fast, he said to the Galatians, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the old yoke of bondage. But listen to what he says to the Ephesians. Remember the Ephesians, to the Ephesians it was written in, from prison. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Take on the whole armour of God. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand. Stand therefore. He says stand so many times. Your loins gird about with truth. It's the truth of the gospel, not the lies, not the predictions, not the, the strange ideas of what's going on. So many conspiracy theories. Stand therefore, your loins girt about with truth and the breastplate of righteousness. And listen, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We stand on our feet. We stand on our feet and our feet have the gospel. So as we close, let's reiterate the gospel. 
Number one, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. We see two things here. The primary purpose in Christ dying, which was for our sins. And secondly, it was according to the scriptures. Never fall into the trap of some of the doctrine that's going around today that Jesus' death on the cross was initiated by an aggressive empire or because his message didn't fit with the religious order of the day. No, as Peter said on the day of Pentecost, him, he was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Sure, God used evil men who hated him and hated his message because they took by wicked hands, they've crucified and slain, but God has raised him up. So Peter, on the day of Pentecost, is preaching exactly the same gospel as Paul. Peter's saying, he died for your sins. He died that you might be forgiven. And secondly, Paul says he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And Paul declares it is the fulfillment of the scriptures that Jesus was buried and rose again. He died. He was buried to prove he died. Three days dead and he rose again. But he doesn't finish there. He finishes by saying he was seen. His resurrection was testified to. Not only the disciples, but to 500 people at once at one stage. And lastly, Paul says, whether it be me or they, so ye heard and so ye believed. It's a gospel not only to be preached, but to believe. So as we enter into a new year, a new time in history, a time in which a lot has changed so quickly, I pray the Lord will visit with you in your time of isolation, that you will be refreshed and revived, and look forward to the amazing things God is going to do in our midst. God bless you. Thank you.